Ryan, great to have you here. Thank you for having me, Andy. This is going to be an interesting conversation because I probably know you better than any other guest that I think I've had on the show, certainly for a long, long time. So I don't want to steal your thunder, but just for our listeners, Ryan is the brave man who bought my investment management business earlier in the year. Now, Ryan and I know each other well beyond that, but Ryan you know, has now sort of taken the reins on that business. And today, that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. But Ryan, you are a very experienced investor and business and I believe this is your first property podcast so it's great to have you on the show and for the first time maybe share your story and everything that you've been getting up to with our audience so to kick us off could you tell us a little bit about yourself who you are where you are and I guess perhaps what exactly you're doing absolutely well thank you uh, very much for having me it's an honor for this to be my first ever property podcast so my story actually started in Florida which is where I was born so I'm a dual US and UK citizen as you can probably tell from my accent, I was raised um, just outside of Greater Manchester in a town called Macclesfield. I moved back to the US uh, when I was in my teens and I actually subsequently joined the US Army. So that's probably something a lot of people don't know about me, which is a bit different. Uh, and then following on from that, I went to university, studied finance and then got an MBA specialising in finance. And from there, moved back to the UK, worked in the corporate world for a while. And then at the end of 2019, I decided to quit my high paying six figure salary job based in London and move back up north to start my own property business. Um, so originally the idea was to be a property developer and make loads of money that way. But I decided at that <laughs> time, um, one of the things I needed to do was also have an agency because I knew that my strategy was going to be HMO investments. So I knew that you know management was a very important part of that. So I decided to start my own agency. And at that time, I thought the agency would kind of be the side business and the investments would be the primary income stream. But actually, as it's transpired, it's the complete opposite. Um, so nowadays, the agency is the primary business. I probably spend about 70% of my time on that with a 30% in the investments business. So our strategy from the investment side is started off with a single let and then we did quite a few HMOs and now we're just finishing up our first commercial to resi development which is sort of where I see the future on that side and as you said we recently acquired um, smart property from yourself earlier in this year and, and bought that onto our existing agency so now we are up to uh, just over 200 units under management uh, we've got six employees and we are operating in three different areas so a couple of the greater manchester as you can probably tell from the map behind me i'm sheffield and now also we're going to preston so quite quite the empire builder right <laughs> uh, and and you know you acquired a great business earlier in the year i've got i've got to say but you you of course know that so yeah. i mean what really strikes me is there there has been a big 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 shift in how you ultimately sort of spend your time you know your nine to five you've gone from the army to you know, the, the world of finance in london and now to to this and that i think takes a certain caliber you need quite a thick skin for that um there's there's a lot to stomach there with those sorts of changes and and, and a huge amount to sacrifice right like a good paying job by the sounds of it in london very well paid job um to being a property investor which we all know or being a property developer which we all know is for a long long time the poorest job in the world because you spend absolutely every penny you have on the projects and so we end up skint don't we as, as property developers for a long long time but talk me through why because this is you know they're big decisions big changes so why did you decide to get into hmos why did you decide to come up from london what has really driven those decisions for you yeah, I think fundamentally, I'm an entrepreneur and I've always wanted to start my own business. And I've been you know, running small businesses since I was probably 13 or 14. You know, things like selling items on eBay, washing cars, starting a promotion business while I was in university. Um, but I suppose this is the first business that I've ever started, which has sort of been able to pay me a full time salary. Um, the reason I did it was because I remember sort of not being quite satisfied. There was something missing for me. And I always knew. That that's what I wanted to do and that's what my future was going to hold so I knew it just had to be done um, and why property I'd always liked it as an investment um, I like the fact that it's real right real real estate um, I like the fact that it grows in you know has capital growth as well as recurring rental uh, income as well so I think as, as an investment class it's one of my favorite um, 
I mean, I think there's a lot in there that I resonate with as well. And, and I think that feeling of something be, just be missing, not, not being quite there when, you know, when I, I was a physio and I, it was a job I enjoyed, but it wasn't a job I loved. And, and it didn't really give me any of the other stuff that I, that I really wanted. And that's tough, isn't it? You know, it's hard to make those decisions, especially when there's a big step back. I like yourself. Yeah. I had a pretty good job. I was able to earn quite a lot of money, actually, especially when I was contracting as physio. And it, it's hard to, to take that huge, huge leap of faith. No regrets, though, Ryan. How many, how many years on are we now? So I timed it perfectly and started right before COVID. So um, this is the <laughs> fourth year. Um, but I think to your, to your point, the word you said earlier was sacrifice, right? You have yeah. to be willing to make a sacrifice yeah. if you want a sort of, I suppose, a better future. Uh, but I can see why it's, it's not suited for most people because it's, it's grueling. It's really, really difficult, especially the first few years, right? I was reading a statistic last night whilst preparing for this that um, let me just pull it up here. I think it's 20% of businesses fail within the first year and then 60% within the first three years. So, and then the primary reason that they fail is because they run out of money, right? So you gotta, you gotta be willing to take the risk and you've gotta be willing to sacrifice and just grind it out and just not give up. There was moments, there's a specific moment I remember in the first year um, when COVID hit and you know, we were all locked down and I kind of thought, what have I done? You know, I really messed this up. And I remember started, I started typing up my CV and as I was typing it, I don't know whether it was just laziness because I didn't want to do it or whether it was like this, this overwhelming feel of just, no, this isn't right. And it just a sinking feel in my belly. And I've got to keep going and keep, keep pushing. I'm glad I did because, you know, I couldn't see myself being an employee, being an employee nowadays. I'm really glad that I didn't sort of make that turn at that time. Just, I kept going. It would have been an easy decision, wouldn't it? To go back, do what you know, Absolutely. you know, do something that's comfortable, yeah. remove a lot of the risk, remove a lot of the uncertainty. Um, yeah, I, I can sympathise with that. And actually, I, I remember there was a time when I'd gone full-time in my stuff, but it was just absorbing so much capital and there were problems. It wasn't you know, necessarily enjoying it all. And um, I applied for another physio job. And um, yeah. yeah, and I can't, I can't remember what year this is. I'm, I'm going back, must sort of be maybe nine years now. So quite, quite a while, eight, nine years, quite, quite a while. Um, mm. But, um, well, fortunately, they never got back to me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it absolutely would have been the wrong thing. And I, and I think that experience in itself taught me, I think like you, I'm quite thick skinned. I'm prepared to to sort of really just grind it out and I, th and I think you and I have that in common but yeah, it, it really took me at times to right to the edge and I thought oh god is this worth it you know there was no like good fortune it was just problem after problem yes there were some results but it was it was really hard work and to be honest it continues to be really really hard work as you and I know and I'm sure we're going to talk about uh, today as well but it's interesting hearing people talk about this kind of thing because i think it's still just too easy isn't it to look on social media look at what other people are doing think that it's all easy that you know with, through rose tinted glasses but the reality is that it it's often so so much harder and what do you think about this ryan i think you said you described yourself as an entrepreneur and i would absolutely agree you're an entrepreneur very much like me mm. big picture thinker likes to move quite quickly um mm. i think there's a big difference between an entrepreneur, a property entrepreneur, and an investor. What characteristics do you think that you possess, you hold, and enabled you to do it? We talked obviously about, about yeah, the fact that it can be quite grueling. So there's obviously there's some characteristics there that allow you to just keep keep moving forwards. Is there anything that you see in yourself that maybe you could pull out that you could almost say, you know, th these are probably some of the reasons why I am able to persist and, and kind of grind it out? Yeah, I think some of the typical characteristics of an entrepreneur is sort of having that itch you can never scratch right so you just there's always something you want to do or another another step you need to take and it's a, a blessing as well as a curse right because i think ultimately if you're like a true entrepreneur you're probably never going to be satisfied with what you have there's always going to be the next goal to, to try and achieve i suppose one of the invest the, the, one of the differences between an entrepreneur and an investor is maybe an investor is more of an operator so they may be more satisfied operating a business and growing like that, whereas an entrepreneur is probably always seeking something new and something different. And there's not one that's better than the other, it's just a different type of personality trait. So yeah, does that kind of answer that question? Yeah, I mean, how do you feel about risk? Risk, yeah, so that's a good point. So certainly as an entrepreneur, you have to not be that adverse to taking risks, right? <laughs> uh, you, Don't look at, I, think, I think that's a gentle way of saying it, yeah. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's um, you have to take risks and you have to be willing to lose. I think a good analogy that I've read previously is like, you know, let's take the, one of the best tennis players of all time, Roger Federer. He didn't become the best tennis player by never losing. So you have to accept that you're going to lose and you're going to make mistakes from time to time. But if you can manage to win more than you lose, then, you know, in the long run, you should be onto a winning there. Yeah, that, that is just a fantastic analogy for business, full stop, I think, because some days you're up, some days you're down. Some yeah. months you're up, some months you're down. And some years you're up and some years you're down. And you've got to be able to just sort of weather those storms, get to the top of those peaks, you know, come down, you know, get out of those troughs, but gradually take a line that, that takes you in that direction upwards, you know, that trajectory towards those goals and those, those objectives. But I think it's an interesting conversation because I, I think more so than at any point in the last 10 15 years now the risks are a little bit bigger i think the rewards yeah. are a little bit smaller and that that's tough and that makes it increasingly difficult for people who are maybe sitting on the sidelines this is certainly what i think i don't know what you think but yeah. to actually get up and motivate themselves to do it um you, yeah. you've got to have that tolerance for risk i totally agree and especially if you're relying on building this empire or building this this portfolio or whatever you want to call it this business through the properties themselves through the deals that you do themselves i think you've got to be super creative really quite kind of capable of of shouldering a certain amount of risk obviously you've got to be really logical and, and really practical and very focused but I just think we are so beyond the days of, of like being able to just buy a property, it kind of going up in value and, and making money because that's sort of what property's done in the last few decades. Do you agree? Yeah, 100%. I think that if you're going to invest in property or business in general, you have to be able to weather the various stages of a business cycle, right? It's not always going to be low interest rates, high profits. You have to be prepared for the time like now when inflation goes up, interest rates, sorry, inflation goes yeah up and interest rates go up with it. Um, and if you can't weather those storms, then maybe you've not set your business up correctly or maybe you're just, you know, maybe not cut out for it. But to be fair, I think most people that I speak to are cognizant of these challenges and, and have been doing a pretty good job. But what you can't do is just blame externalities for issues that you have within your business. You have to be prepared to deal with that. And, you know, sometimes you're not going to make as much money and that's OK. Right? That's OK because maybe later on you, you, you will spoken like a, a true leader ryan should we talk about the agency then because i think this is a really interesting balance that you, that you have in your own business model but also we don't often get the opportunity to talk to agency owners on the show and certainly not agency owners whose business i have as good understanding as i do of, of yours so and, and i think there's also this interesting conversation here around you're ramping your agency up and you're scaling out and you see opportunity there and actually for personal reasons, I decided it was time for me to exit that that world, and I kind of felt like I'd done what I could. So, I thought it'd be an interesting conversation to have. Now, for all of our nosy listeners out there, look, I'm afraid that one thing that Ryan are not going to share is what Ryan paid for the business. <laughs> We're going to keep that to ourselves. But what I will say is, I'm going on a very nice holiday in um, <laughs> a few days' time <laughs> that um, Ryan has paid for. <laughs> so, Hope you enjoy but, it. Yeah, but no, in, Ryan. In all seriousness, look, agency work, as you and I know, is not for everyone. Building an agency, and particularly building a HMO agency, right? So, tell us. Why? Why do you want to do this? Why are you scaling this up? And how does this fit in your broader strategy and your personal objectives? I suppose initially, as I mentioned before, the reason I started it was primarily to manage my own properties and then you know, a few other select clients, but it's actually grown quite a lot bigger and faster than I ever expected it would. I think as a business, it's, I, I think it's a really good business because it's recurring revenue and it's typically very sticky. Like once you get a client, Providing you do a good job for them, they'll typically stay with you for quite a long time. So, they, so the lifetime of the client is is pretty good. Some of the downsides of of having an agency is you're basically just constantly solving problems. That's what that's how I kind of look at the agency. Right? Nobody ever calls you up and says, "Oh, it's been great. I love it." <laughs> it's so true. It, it's, <laughs> no, it's a thank. It, it, I mean, it's it is what it is, but it is a thankless task. It is, isn't it? Really, yeah. it is. Hundred yeah, percent. It's it's a very thankless job. Yeah. But it, it's also quite rewarding. One thing I will say is, you know, when I've done viewings and check people in, and typically when we've done refurbishments on properties uh, and then also manage them afterwards, it is quite satisfying to see somebody move into a new home and that sort of look of, you know, oh, this is generally quite nice. I'm happy to be here. That, that's quite rewarding, I suppose. But otherwise, yeah, you're just constantly fixing issues, maintenance, 
you know, difficult tenants from time to time, you know, you know how it goes, but that's, that's the job and that's what we do. And that's why people pay us to do it for them. You know, we, the service that we offer is, you know, we give back our landlord clients a lot of time. We reduce the risk for them and usually we can get higher revenues for them than they would otherwise be able to get themselves because we understand the local market. I mean, I have to agree with all that. It's a tough job building an agency. It's it's a people business. You've got to be really good with people. Lots and lots of moving parts, but fundamentally, sticky income, like you said, that's something we've talked about many, many times. And if you do a good job for your clients, they'll stay and they'll keep paying. And we know that that the lettings market is buoyant and is going to continue to be extremely buoyant. It's just something that we need in the UK. And and that for me is a great a great business model. And Interestingly, I think in the HMO space, it's not actually that competitive. There are not that many good agents that you can go to for HMO management. If you want a single let service, go to anyone on the high street, and they'll you know, there's a bit of a price war. You know, you'll get people charging as little as five percent. Now, it's, you, know, you can't do that in the HMO space because it wouldn't be profitable. But I think it's an interesting model, and I think it's also worth saying on the show today that I didn't I didn't sell the business because of the things that I didn't like about it. <laughs> it wasn't because nobody was saying thank you. You know, actually, it was a great business, very profitable business, and I and it was and it has been incredibly rewarding, creating lots of great homes. We we had a lot of really good deals on you know, rent to rent leases. That is obviously a big part of big reason as to why you you bought the business. But for me, it was a timing thing, right? I was ready to invest more of my time into other things. I felt like I'd benefited and got what I wanted and needed from that business and from that business model. But I felt like I'd reached my own limitations. I didn't think I could do much more or take it much further. And I wasn't in the mindset where I wanted to scale that model up. I wanted to scale my other things up, more so my development work and my own portfolio. And and really, that, that was just a very personal decision. But it wasn't actually because we had fundamental issues or anything like that in the business. It was good business and, and actually a business where I'd largely been able to sort of put my feet up because we had it well systemized and operating well we had a great team running stuff let's talk about the acquisition process then because i think that that was new for both of us wasn't it um me selling and and you buying i mean now that what are we six months on from it was the process of buying a business as you expected what on like you know how how do you feel about it all not kind of that process of buying a business so i think it occurred quite organically, right? So I had on my list of goals for 2022, one of them was to buy another agency because I thought it'd be a good way to grow. Um, and presumably one of your goals was you starting to think about selling it. So I think that conversation came up quite organically. Hmm. And one of the reasons I wanted to do it with, with, with your business was because we already had that relationship and quite a high level of trust. And because it's something I never done before, I knew there'll be mistakes I would make and I knew there'll be things I didn't know, but I knew that at least by doing it with you, I wasn't going to get completely shafted. You know, so that was a, quite a quite a big advantage. And I think the other thing which was quite good was that we always kept a line of communication open between ourselves. And as you know, with solicitors, things can get tangled up quite quickly when they're just talking to each other. Whereas we were always able to sort of circumvent those issues by just saying, okay, what do you think about this? Yeah, we'll do that and just tell our solicitors accordingly. So I think that was a big benefit for us. Um, it was quite I comforting think, that, wasn't it? That, I think for both of us, um, yeah. With a party that you didn't know, I guess it's just like buying a house or selling a property. You know, there's always that element of you're not quite sure what the next move is going to be. Where you and I, we had such a great relationship. It, it was an incredibly transparent process, wasn't it? Which, which was really yeah. quite reassuring, I think, for both of us. Absolutely, yeah. I think that that helped. I'm glad we sort of went through that process for the first time together, and you know, I've learned a, a huge amount from doing it, and I certainly it's something I would do again. But with the knowledge we have, those sort of some things I do a lot differently, and you know, that's part of the learning process, isn't it? But overall, I think it's been a great experience for me, uh, hopefully for you as well. Um, and yeah, like I said, I'd certainly do it again. If you have any I- other businesses you want to sell, let me know. <laughs> I'm not ready to sell any of the other businesses yet, but um, it's, I don't know whether they ever told you this, but in fact, no, I, I think because we've got quite a close relationship, I, I think I remember telling you I was talking about to a couple of people about selling the business. I, I saw I'd marketed it very discreetly. And I had quite a bit of interest, you know, through those discreet channels. Mm. And um, for various reasons, none of them quite came to fruition. One guy literally went to prison for something, <laughs> which is really bizarre. I remember yeah. waking up and like, what, this guy's... Okay. I think um, I know what you mean. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's it, right? You just 
whereas you and I had this really transparent relationship. We knew each other really well, trusted each other implicitly. Um, and yeah, I think I remember saying, yeah, yeah, actually, I think the time's right. And, and you were like, oh, OK. And we, we'd never actually had that. It wasn't like I came to you, was it, and said, hey, Ryan, I'm selling the business. Do you want to buy it? It was just actually I was I was telling you that I was having these conversations with some other people and you were like, well, actually, why don't we? Yeah, which, which was a nice way, to, I think, to have done the deal. And then I think what was really nice as well is I knew that my staff and the team and, and all of our tenants were going to be in really safe hands. And, yeah. and you knew that I was going to be st- st- I, you know, I've stayed on with you in a consultancy role in the business, haven't I? Which has been quite nice. Yeah. And actually, there have been quite a few things that have come up, haven't there? Where yeah. actually it's been really useful to have a direct line straight to me <laughs> to yeah. sort out some of these issues in the business. And yeah, I, look, I think it was a great experience as well. And actually, I'm, sh- I'm sure every business transaction isn't quite like that. But it's definitely something long term I'd like to do again. I'd like to sell another business. So who knows when or what that business will be i'll I'll let you know when when, ryan though (laughs) yeah certainly do yeah i think buying a business because there may be some people listening who are thinking about doing that um i think for me i would sooner buy a business than start a business if i were to do it again i think it's been a great experience starting my own business but it's bloody difficult it's grueling like i've literally been to war and that was easier than starting a business. Um, (laughs) It's incredibly difficult and you've got to have an incredible amount of grit and determination to do it. Whereas when you're buying a business, you're kind of skipping that most difficult stage of a business's life, which is typically the first few years, right? You're kind of Mm. skipping that bit, buying something with an existing customer base, an existing set of employees, and then sort of building off that. And if it's something that you already know or an industry you're already active in, then it's it's even easier to do because you can kind of just take your existing business and then bolt it on, bolt on the new new business to what you've already got. Which when so you look you... at a lot of very successful businesses and business owners, that is often how they've yeah. got there. Yeah, often through acquisition, yeah. bolting things onto their existing operations, yeah. buying established yeah. things that are set up. And it's probably worth us saying that actually, because I think it would be easy at this point to assume that you came, Ryan, with loads of cash and you said, here you go, Andy. And, and actually that's not how we did the deal at all, is it? We did a really creative deal, which actually... Yeah. We both learned is a pretty standard method in, in business, but actually, mm-hmm. you use a lot of the cash in the business that I had accrued to actually, you know, in part complete the transaction, and then there's like a deferred element, all really pretty standard stuff, and that was a nice way of doing it because I wasn't particularly bothered about getting everything on day one. You obviously didn't want to pay everything on day one because that would put the business under more pressure. So actually, the way that we did the deal, really creative. Um, I, I think actually for a lot of people listening, if they were genuinely interested in scaling up through acquisition and whether it's an agency or into rent business or something else, there are definitely some, some very creative methods where actually you can do this with little, maybe even in some instances, no capital of your own. So, which I think is really interesting because it's hard to do that when you're actually buying property. Yeah. You need, you kind of need a lot of cash to buy property, don't you really? Let's talk about what the day-to-day is like for you then, Ryan. You, you run the, the agency now. You, you, you're busy. It's been a busy time recently, hasn't it, with student changeovers and things like that. There's been a lot of operational yeah. change for you. We've been transitioning a lot of your existing agency or portfolio over to the student stuff, which perhaps we yeah. can come back and talk about. But what does a typical week look like for you as a business owner, as an entrepreneur? You've got your own deals, your developments and things like that. Yeah. So... Just to back up for one second, so when we when I bought the business, so I sort of had a three stage process. The first stage was going to be um, sort of steady the ship, right? So the first stage was just get everything settled, speak to the clients, speak to the employees, make sure everybody's sort of settled. And then the next stage, which has taken a lot longer than I expected, was consolidation. So obviously, with Smart Property and Gallicom, there were two different sets of systems, and pretty much every different system, every system was different. So there was a lot of back and forth on that. Like initially we tried to go to uh, eight, uh, one system and then decided to sort of transition back to the one we were already on. So that's taken a long time. We're now probably in the last sort of, I'd say four more weeks of, of, of that period. And then we'll go on to, you know, the, the, hopefully the growth stage. A typical week, um, well, that's one th- nice thing about owning a business is often not always the same. So it's quite interesting. Mm-hmm. And we've got a really good team of people, there's six of us now. So... I've been trying to get myself out of the day-to-day actual managing of the properties and let the property managers do that. Uh, and I'm trying to focus on building processes, um, you know, looking at new acquisitions, trying to build the client base. Uh, and then I really need to start thinking about doing more marketing. So I think one of my weaknesses is I'm 
naturally an operations guy. My business ethos has always been, if we can provide a really good service, then word of mouth will be our marketing. We'll let our clients talk about us. And that, that is working, but it's slow, right? It takes a long time to build that. And obviously, you know, and so you've got quite a large customer base that it just takes a long time to develop a company that way. So now I'm going to start focusing on rebranding or, or looking at strengthening our branding and then looking at how can we get ourselves out there some more. So I suppose it's a good start, right? Doing a podcast. <laughs> it, uh, this stuff's exciting, isn't it? You know, that for me and all those challenges and pull, putting all these parts of the puzzle together, that's the bit that as an entrepreneur in property, I really enjoy like solving those problems, figuring things out, trying things. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it does. I yeah. like, like you just said, that every day is different. I'd be really bored. I, I used to be really bored when that, that wasn't the case. And I think that certainly for me, the challenging moments and the difficult moments, and there are many, <laughs> but is offset by that. But yeah, yeah, it's offset by the challenge and the buzz that I get and you obviously get from figuring all that stuff out and playing around with it and the fact that you don't quite know what the result is going to be, which mm. I think is actually, it's certainly a lot of people in our community, I think that those, I think that is deep down in there somewhere with them. And if it is, I, you know, I would encourage anyone to seriously sort of maybe follow, think about following their dreams, give it a period of time, mm. be prepared to make those sacrifices, but just give it a go. Be prepared to make mistakes as well. Like I always look at things as an in an iterative process. So you try something, it may work, you may tweak it a little bit, and then sort of just keep improving, improving. If you can just get one percent better each day, then eventually you have a really strong business and set of processes. Sorry, what are you gonna say? Yeah. I was gonna ask you uh, about the management of the tenants and particularly this transition or this sort of, we've been moving more of your existing professional stuff over to student stuff, haven't we, over time? And I think this is an interesting yeah. conversation, one that we don't have enough on the podcast, because I think a lot of investors coming into the market, they think and they see professional HMOs as being the gold standard, the most profitable method. But can yeah. we talk a little bit about why you've moved more stuff over to student HMOs? Because I think somebody coming from an agency background with all of this experience probably you know, is the sort of person that we should be listening to when it comes to these sorts of decisions. Yeah, so it's an interesting one. So when I started my property journey and was looking at HMOs, and obviously students uh, is one of those options, I didn't want to do it. And I just kind of thought they're going to go and they're going to absolutely annihilate the house. And then it's just going to cost those money to repair everything. Um, so I initially thought that professionals would be more profitable. Have, however, now having seen both sides of the coin, in my opinion, and for my next HMO investment, I will look at a student one. And there's a few reasons for that. One is that although students do make a bit of a mess, they kind of you kind of know they're going to do it, and you factor <laughs> that in. But the other thing, <laughs> I think the students are more happy to just go in for a year, do their thing. There's going to be a few imperfections which they're okay with because they're going to add to those imperfections, and then they leave and a new cycle comes in. And that that cyclical nature, or cyclical nature of it, is also really compelling because you know exactly when they're going to come in and when they're going to leave. And you don't have this issue, which you often have with professionals, uh, whereby they're all in individual tenancies. So they're just in and out throughout the year. And you might get unlucky whereby um, one of them decides to leave, let's say on you know, the 1st of December. And then it can be quite difficult at times to fill that room in, you know, over Christmas. Um, whereas obviously with the students, they're all on the same AST. So I think that's another big benefit of that. And the other one, I think one of the fundamental risks to um, the professional HMO market is the council tax issue, which I'm, I know you mm -hmm. spoke about on the podcast before. And, and hopefully that will be resolved whereby, you know, it, it should be the same across the entire country. But until it is, it, I think it's a risk which we have to consider. And you don't have that with students because obviously they don't pay council tax. And then the other thing is, I mean, certainly in the areas that we operate in, especially in Manchester, the demand for student housing is just off the charts and they just can't build... Mm -hmm enough accommodation for students there's a real need for for that accommodation and i think that's only going to grow over the next sort of five to ten years well you've obviously been listening to what i've said over the years ryan because <laughs> all I, I i echo all of that i think there's a point as well i think one or two professional hmos and self-managing them it's okay but beyond that it, it's quite tricky you know you've got five uh, so maybe 15 to 20 tenants maybe maybe even more across three hmos 
if the average tenancy is 18 months, you, people are constantly coming and going. You've got mm-hmm. viewings that need to be done in the evenings and at weekends because that's the nature yeah. of young working professionals, isn't it? They work nine to five. You know, it, you've got multiple sort of communication channels because you know whilst they might be cohesive and have a community environment now it's often actually professional tenants certainly you know will want to email directly and have your their issues dealt with directly whereas student groups it's, it's a little bit different they'll often, often approach as a group because they're on a joint tenancy so yeah totally agree lots of things there and, and i think your point around the buoyancy of the student market is so pertinent at the minute i mean it is quite literally bonkers in some parts of the country at the minute which is obviously frustrating for students and and the universities but look we're here to make money and run businesses and that's our strategy and and it's great for us because we've got more tenants we've got less competition relatively speaking and um you know i think it's it's an area that's going to see a lot of or a lot more growth in the coming years so yeah i I think some really good advice there and definitely i would um i'd echo what you say and and encourage anyone who's thinking about getting into hmos or or scaling things up to um yeah to seriously think about about the student model just just to add that on the professional market i still think that's a really strong investment as well like we're seeing huge demand all around greater manchester and the other areas we're operating and again i think that's an area which will continue to grow so i think both are good options i wouldn't say one's not good put it that way one's not good but we both have a preference i think don't we yeah exactly yeah both good but there's a preference um ryan you've got a lot of experience in property and in business now and i've got a few questions i, I want to Put you on the spot a little bit but for our listeners okay. today uh, maybe just getting started maybe sort of ramping up their their property business and um, we've talked about some of the challenges but is there a, is there a standout challenge in your property career so far that's worth sharing today for the benefit of our listeners because i think it i think there's a, some strange satisfaction we all get from listening to how other people have dealt with with problems i think one thing I may have done differently if I was to start over would be I wouldn't have quit my job when I did. I think that in my head, I was going to develop like four or five HMOs in the first year. And it just, everything takes longer than you expect in property. So you've got to just always expect things will take longer than you expect. But what I think it makes sense to have a cash flow strategy at the same time as having your investment strategy. The investments is kind of a long-term play. But you need something to, you know, pay for your personal salary to have your, you know, your lifestyle that you want. And that can be a job. Like, I don't think, mm. although I just quit my job and, and, and went straight into it, I don't think it's a bad thing to have your job and then do your property business on the evenings or the weekends while you, while you build it up to sort of replace your, your income. So I think that's probably one thing that I would have done differently and a challenge that I would share. I think that's really great advice, and I and I totally agree. I think you and I both like running trading businesses alongside our investment portfolios because it just makes it that little bit easier to extract cash. It's very tax efficient to invest it into the assets, which if you just walk away from a job and don't have that cash flowing business model, it's difficult to, to grow a portfolio as quickly. If you've got a big lump of capital, that's great but you've got to make it work very very hard to continue scaling it up from almost within the the, the portfolio itself so um, yeah totally agree with that i think that's great advice if you could give one piece of advice to people just getting started maybe in the early stages of their business what would that be to help them get where they want to be perhaps as quickly as possible so one would be just don't give up right it, there's going to be times when you're thinking of quitting and you just need to crack on. You just need to keep going, keep pushing. And eventually, if you're determined enough and make the right steps, you will get there. So that's probably the key piece of advice that I would give people. But on a more practical level, you know, you definitely want to have a good idea of what your goals are and have a plan of how to get there. And your plan will change, and that's okay. But just have a good plan and take on the advice of somebody who has done what you want to do. So. For example, you know, I've always had mentors um, and they've always been people who are, you know, a certain amount of steps ahead of where I want to be. And I've done the exact same thing that I want to do. So how better to get to where you want to be than to find out somebody who's done that and then learn from their mistakes um, rather than making them yourself. I think that's been critical for my growth. 
I think that's that's really great advice and I would I'd reiterate that actually as well particularly the point around having a mentor I had a mentor for many many years that mentor opened many doors for me helped me you know just kept me on the straight and narrow <laughs> picked me up when I needed it most and actually you know was one of the the people who really helped me actually ultimately sell the business because he helped me systemize it and build that, that business in the way that it needed to be so that it could at one point be be sold. So I owe a huge amount to him. And I think our relationship is similar. We've worked together and actually that relationship has in it's been great and I've been help, able to help you build your own agency over the years, but actually it's opened other doors for each of us as well. And um, it just goes to show the value of having those really important connections, those people who've been in the industry um, maybe a few steps ahead or have a bit more experience in certain areas that can just potentially open doors that you might otherwise find a bit more difficult to open yourself. What does the future hold then, Ryan? What can we expect in the next couple of years for Ryan and for the Galacom empire? <laughs> yeah, I think for the rest of this year, we're going to finish sort of consolidating everything and sort of take stock of where we are because we've had a lot of growth recently. Next year, I'd like to do a few more commercial resi developments and, and probably look at expanding further through both acquisition but also as i said previously you know leveling up our marketing game quite a bit um so that's certainly something we need to work on five to ten years from now we'll have to see i think i just enjoy the process i enjoy doing this every day i'm quite fortunate in that respect that i'm quite passionate about business and i just i enjoy it it's not all about the money for me it's just about being able to enjoy what i do um and as long as i continue to enjoy what i do i just keep going and, and see where we end up and uh, next acquisition, two thousand and twenty-four. What do we think? Uh, we'll be looking. We'll be we'll be, we'll be looking to see what there is out there. Certainly, I think. Um, yeah, I think certainly in twenty twenty-four we'll be looking to, you know, do another acquisition, if not more. So. Ryan, for anyone listening today, you, you're operating in a few areas. You've, you've got a fantastic management business. Um, of course, I know that because part of it was mine. But um, just remind us exactly where you're based. So you're based in Sheffield. You're based in yep. Manchester, central Manchester, mm -hmm. and you yep. said Preston as well. That's right, yeah. So we cover all of Greater Manchester, so all of, you know, all the different boroughs, and then Preston and also Sheffield. If anyone wants to reach me directly, you can get hold of us on Instagram, so it's galacom.property, or you can email us at support at galacom.com, and we'll be happy to help. Fantastic, Ryan. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I was looking forward to it anyway, because you and I like to chat shop don't we it's always good fun just chatting yep. about property and business with you but um look i'm really kind of proud of everything that you've achieved because i know i have watched how hard you have worked and i think you've been really honest in just sort of sharing the realities of how hard and, and how much sacrifice is often required to do this and i'm really excited to see how far you take all this and i'm really excited to you know continue being a part of it with you but thanks for coming on the show today thanks for sharing your story thanks for inspiring our our guests and our our listeners and thanks for um, sharing your experiences with us thank you very much for, for having me it's been an honor thank you